Welcome to Engage for Influence. I'm Charlana Kelly, and I'm going to be taking you on a journey of learning why we need to influence the world around us in a more powerful way, a more dynamic way than maybe you've ever learned before. It's all going to be based in the Word of God. It's not really anything new, but perhaps the Holy Spirit will give you a newness of understanding, a deeper revelation of His wisdom as we go through. Let's get in. Let's dig in. It's time to feast on the Word of God. Be sure to stay tuned to the end where I give some announcements about our next episode. So what is Engage for Influence? What am I talking about when I use those words for the title of this series of programs that we're going to come together and learn together in? Well, first off, Engage is an action word. It means we're going to actually do something. And by doing something, we're going to have an effect on it. Influence really for you and I as believers in Jesus Christ means divine influence from heaven, the power of God moving through us to shift and bring change to people and places around us. Today, I want to lay a little bit of a foundation before we begin, because in the days ahead, I'm going to teach you why we need to engage. We really need to look at it because we are living in what is termed a post modern society. And that means that things are going more towards the secular type of belief system, humanism, all of the worldliness is coming in to try to choke out the faith that we have in Jesus Christ. (laughs) And we know that everyone needs Jesus, that Jesus is what will heal the world. And so faith in him, believes there, and then acting and doing, engaging and releasing his power into the earth. During these programs over the next, let's say, 13 weeks, I'm going to teach you how to build an edifice or a strong tower of God around you that stretches literally from earth to heaven. We're going to break that down and build a very deep foundation for you in Jesus Christ through the word of God. You know, through the prophet Isaiah, God said, I watch over my word to perform it. It will not return to me void. That means that when we speak God's word, when we have faith and trust in God's word and promises, Every time we release them through our mouth in prayer or in proclamation, boy, I tell you, the angels go to work to bring that word to pass. Just like Psalm 100 said, the angels do the word of God. That is an interesting play on words because I would say that's the will of God, right? But listen, God's word is his will and we need to put his word in our hearts and therefore out of the abundance of our heart our mouth speaks and so we are speaking his word over every person and every situation that we encounter so over the coming episodes you're going to learn about why we need to engage how we need to engage and where we need to engage because God has given you influence. He's given you spheres of influence, as Paul said in 2 Corinthians 10, 13. Now he was talking about the fact that he was, he was encouraging the church at Corinth to not be moved by what other people are doing, not try to exert any authority over something another person is doing, to lay claim to it, so to speak. He was saying that I am only going to boast or glory 
in my sphere of influence, which li literally he called it a sphere. But when you look at the deeper meaning of that through the language of the Greek, you know, that was all written in Greek. So we can study and dig into the Greek language and learn what the scripture is teaching and training us to do. That word sphere literally means a field of influence, which takes me back also to Proverbs 31 when it talks about the field and the vineyard. There's a very different meaning of both of those. Your field is what's right around you, the people that you are sowing into, imparting Christ into, imparting love into them, making a difference in their life with the message of the gospel. Those people are a part of your field. You see them every day. You walk by them on your way to work. You interact with them in your family. They're in your family. Oh my goodness. What would it profit any of us to gain the whole world and lose our family or lose our brothers? We should be most active in the relationships that we have around us that God has given us influence to speak into their lives and to help them along the way to find Jesus. So these uh, vineyards, though, are actually uh, significant in the Hebrew language of the actual realm of influence. These are places. These are, are a, a region, so to speak, or people in this certain area. And God has given us influence. We don't have another man's influence. You don't have my influence. I don't have your influence. But we have influence that God has given us, and we're to use it now in this time. I'm telling you this, I believe God is raising up a mighty army in this day who will know him and know the authority that he has given all of us, like Luke shared in the gospel of Luke, that he'd given us all power and authority over all the works of Satan, all of the demonic, and that we were to go and release his power and authority to heal the sick. That's what he said in Luke 9 verses 1 and 2. So we've been given all of this power and authority. And in this hour, God is looking for the sons of God that are going to rise up and be who he created us to be. Royal priests, ambassadors, people who are able to release a word of power through God's wisdom like Daniel did to King Nebuchadnezzar and then other kings after him that is going to bring deliverance to our people. So we should really be students of God's wisdom. Amen. Praise the Lord. We're going to dig into that wisdom in each episode and we're going to learn how to step into a situation and shift it. You know, Jesus was the great shifter of re, uh, things that were taking a place, events that were unfolding. One of the most powerful ones is also in the book of Luke in his account of the adulterous woman that was drugged uh, by a screaming mob outside the city gates to be stoned to death for her sin. Jesus is there, and if you remember the account of it, he is literally drawing in the sand. While all of this craziness is going on, I think that you can relate with me when I say that there was a lot of screaming, there was a lot of crying, there was a lot of yelling, a lot of accusation, a lot of threats going on, and here he is drawing in the sand. He said one thing that shifted that whole event. He stood up and he said this, He who is without sin, let him cast the first stone. Then he stooped back down and started writing in the sand again. That doesn't make sense, does it? Who would do that? But he had in divine influence from heaven itself and the wisdom of God, the strategies of God to know how to handle that, that violent mob. It really was a mob scene. As he stooped back down and he allowed the Holy Spirit to come in and do what the Holy Spirit does, he came in and convicted their hearts. And when the Holy Spirit convicts our hearts, 
it causes us to self-reflect. And so each one of them began to reflect on their own heart. And they thought, I have a lot of sin in my life. Let he who is without sin cast the first stone. And so everyone, one by one, begins to drop their stones. And one by one, they all walk away. And when they're all gone, and this, this woman, Jesus says to her, Woman, where are your accusers? He shifted. He shifted their perspective He shifted literally the atmosphere, what was very angry and violent, all of a sudden becomes silent. And they leave. You know, Satan is the accuser of the brethren. He loves to accuse you and me. (laughs) But Jesus is our advocate, and he is ever at the throne making intercession for you and I and for those who believe in him. And the accuser has no footing. He has no basis to be there because by the blood of the Lamb, we've been cleansed from all unrighteousness, sanctified, brought in to the sheepfold, the family of God. He has no way of accusing us anymore if we remain hidden in Christ. And our hearts are loyal to him and our desires are to do things his way. He shifted that atmosphere with the power and the presence and the truth of God. That's what you and I are called to do in every situation and circumstance, even in nations where it's illegal to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. Your presence alone can change the atmosphere. We see a great example of it in Psalm 84, verse 6. It says there that they walk through the valley of Baca. Baca meaning weeping and mourning. And they turn it into a spring. And the rains come and turn it into a pool. That word pool in the Hebrew literally means blessing. That's what the people of God are to do in every situation. Whether we're preaching the gospel or not, our mere presence has the ability to change things. But we must be aware of our power and authority so that we can enforce it. We enforce it by prayer. We enforce it by our words, not condemning words, not words that bring death, but words that bring life, words that bring joy, words that bring healing. And we should be doing it everywhere. And there's no law against this to bring joy and peace and love into every nation into every family, into every neighborhood. Peace is what brings tranquility and blessing and freedom and unity and liberty because Jesus is the Prince of Peace. When we believe that and we begin to release the Prince of Peace into every single thing that we're involved in, then let me tell you something, leaders will come knocking on our door to find out what we know and how we know it. And there it is, the springboard for the gospel. Romans 8 tells us that the whole earth is groaning, even now, waiting for the revealing of the sons of God. 
that is not meaning that only men are going to be the sons of God. What that word means is the family of God. Uh, a lot of times in the scripture, it refers to he or him. It, it, it doesn't mean a, a gender there. In fact, Paul went on to say later in the epistles, he said that there's neither Greek nor Jew, male or female. We are all one together in Christ. Oh, I know that might step on some toes, but the truth is the truth. And we have to receive the truth if we're going to walk in the full, because to do anything other than that is to have a vain argument. And we're not arguing with one another. We are arguing with the word of God. But Jesus said, don't take a care when people become offended because they're really offended for the word's sake. Let that not be you. Amen. Let that not be you. Embrace his word. Know his word. Study his word. And like Paul at the end of his life, he said in Philippians 3, 8 and 9 out of the Amplified, he said, it is my determined purpose that I may know him, that I may become progressively acquainted, more intimately acquainted with him, perceiving and recognizing his person. He said, preceding that, that anything that he had ever done early in his life, in that moment, he counted it as dung. It was worthless to him because the excellency of this life is knowing Christ and knowing the power that flows from his resurrection that exerts itself over us. What does that mean? That we are to release that same power and presence of God into every place and person we come in contact with. That is what the sons of God are gonna look like. You know, this knowing of Christ is, is really the supreme advantage for success. It should be our daily pursuit. But we can't know him if we don't look into the word and see his character and look at his integrity and follow his example. If we're just following men, if we're just following some tradition that was established by men, even in the church. If we're just following the traditions of men, then we are not going to have the power to shift the atmosphere and the hearts and minds of people by just daily living our life. You know, I'm reminded of Paul in the book of Acts, chapter five, verses 12 through 16, and we'll focus in on 15, but it says, and and through the hands of the apostles, many signs and wonders were done among the people. And they were with one accord in Solomon's porch. Yet none of the rest dared join them. There was so much power there. It was kind of like Moses when he came down off the mountain and he had the glory of the Lord on his face. Oh my goodness, the people were afraid of him. That's the fear of the Lord, really. That's not fear as in trepidation. It's not that kind of fear. The fear is the reverent awe of God. They recognized that God was with them and they saw the power of God flowing through them. And and the fear of the Lord came upon them. And Proverbs tells us the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. So we all should honor and revere and be in awe of God's mighty works in the earth. It goes on in verse 14. It says, and the believers were increasingly added to the Lord multitudes of both men and women so that they brought the sick out into the streets and laid them on beds and couches that at least the shadow of Peter passing by might fall on some of them. Why? Because there was going to be an effect when he walked by. People were going to get healed People might even be raised from the dead. Why? Because Jesus said that that we would do these acts that he had done greater because he went to be with the Father. Greater. And it goes on and, and it says, 
Also a multitude gathered from the surrounding cities to Jerusalem, bringing sick people and those who were tormented by unclean spirits, and they were all healed. All. They were all healed. Friends, I have to tell you something very, very important that we all should know. That is that there is more power in you than you can imagine. In fact, all of the powers of heaven are backing you up in everything you do and say. But here's the thing. You've got to get in agreement with what God says. We're not out here just willy nilly doing whatever we want and causing strife and contention and causing a, a, a dark shadow to come upon ourselves. We live our life with integrity, with honor. We are nobility and we need to learn how to live like it in quietness and assurance. You know, I think about Daniel all the time. I think about Esther all the time. Later on in this series of programs, we're going to talk about game changers, people that were able to step in and shift. Daniel was able to shift with the wisdom of God. Esther was able to bring deliverance with the wisdom of God. Deborah was able to bring deliverance with the, the power and authority of God. And surely Jesus, I already gave an example. He was able to shift. They were game changers. And multitudes of people were won because of their fearless courage to go forth and do what was right in the sight of the Lord. I'm telling you this, there is no limit <laughs> to what God wants to do through you and what he will do through you if you will just yield your heart to him. Surrender. Surrender means to cease resistance. Give up. Say, here I am, Lord. Do with me as you will. You know, some of the pow most powerful prayers in the Bible came in two very very important incidences, and we can learn from them. When Jesus was in the garden, he said, if this cup can pass from me, nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. After he said that, angels came and strengthened him or released grace in him to go through what he was going to go through. Notice it didn't happen before. It happened after he surrendered. Not my will, but yours be done, Lord. And then I love Mary who has this amazing encounter with an angel who tells her something too fantastic for her to even imagine. And she says, very simply, be it unto me according to your word. So we should always seek in every situation to do things God's way, his will, his way. That's how maximum glory comes how deliverance comes, how salvation comes, and ultimately how restoration will come by a group of people, the remnant of God who surrender and give him all, all of it. Unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, there can be no harvest. There can be no harvest. And really and truly, the greatest death is not the physical death. The greatest death is the spiritual death. The getting rid of the flesh, letting it go, and moving on with God. I want to close with this one scripture. It's actually a combination of two, but it comes out of Proverbs. We're going to be really learning a lot from the Proverbs in the weeks ahead. Uh, the greatest jewels of wisdom are found there. If I were you, I'd be reading them daily if I can. But I want to talk to you about influence and engagement as we close. I'm going to say a prayer and, and, uh, and then we'll close today. But out of Proverbs 3, this is coming from the Passion Translation. So it's a little different maybe than the Bible you read. But I want you just to close your eyes and listen. Proverbs 3, verses 3 and 4, it says, Hold on to loyal love and don't let go. 
and be faithful to all that you have been taught. Let your life be shaped by integrity with truth written upon your heart, God's truth. That's how you will find favor and understanding with both God and men, and you will gain the reputation of living a life well. You know, oftentimes we're just living our life and people show up. It's like we're the tree of life, the Word of God. People want to come and they just want to sit and listen. Impart into people around you the goodness, the joy, the love, the blessing of God. The Great Commission is to Go, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and then making these new converts into disciples by teaching and training them the ways of God, showing them how to follow Christ and do the same thing He did in the earth. That's what you're called to do. That's what I'm called to do. That's what I'm hopefully going to do here. I'm praying for you every day. Let's, let's close in prayer real quick. And I have just a, an announcement about the next episode. Don't miss one. If you can record them, record them. If not, get your download them if they're on demand. But get your journal out with me every week. And let's study the Word of God together. Amen. Father, I pray for these who have joined us today and watching this episode. Father, first and foremost, I pray that they would come to full knowledge and faith of Jesus Christ, that like Paul, they would make it their determined uh, purpose to know you progressively more intimately. May everyone who looks in on their life know that they know you, Father. For those that may not know Christ, I pray that you would throw down your idols. Why would we worship? creation or created things, when we can worship the Creator who created it all. It's all idolatry unless we're worshiping the one true God. Throw down your idols and lift up your hands and receive Jesus today as Lord and Savior, and the peace you've been pursuing will flood your heart and your mind. Invite Him to begin to move through you in power and in might. Amen. Thanks for joining today. I ask those things in Jesus' name. And next week, we're going to really dig in on why we need to engage. I'm going to spend a few weeks just talking about the current state of the world, really, and why we need to engage, why we need to act and enforce the defeat of Satan and release the goodness and the power of God wherever we go. It's going to be exciting. You're going to learn a lot, and we are going to have a blessed time together in the Lord. Amen. Until we meet again, God bless you and Godspeed. Speed.